What's up guys, Ryan Schultz here from E39 Source in Escondido, California. And we've got a bit of a restoration project, another one of those here. This is a lovely 2003 E39 M5 finished in titanium silver metallic, the M1 SW complete leather, black leather interior, and just a little bit over 90,000 miles. This car was just acquired by the brother of the previous owner. Now we've got about six weeks time or so to go through uh, the approved jobs based on the PPI or pre-purchase inspection that we completed on the car. And uh, the goal is going to be to kind of turn this thing around. It's a little tired. It needs some mechanical maintenance. It needs some cosmetic work. These wheels are going to be going. Um, looks like we're going to be pretty stock, kind of an OEM plus build. And uh, just make this thing shine again and make it pretty on the inside and the outside. And it's what I call a high surf day here in Southern California. It is 48 degrees and raining today. Very unpleasant, uncomfortable. I think I'm going to get started on a few light things tonight, but we'll kind of get an idea of the car and the condition and go around and um, show you guys what it is. So I said 2003. It's a late 02 build. It's a car that appears to have been um, outside maybe here in California a little bit. We see a lot of cracks in the wood trim. Um, bubbled up shifter. People reach out to me all the time and say, hey, how do I get the insert for my center console little little storage tray? And I'm like, insert? What are you talking about? The tray? No, the rubber part that goes in it. Well, it turns out as this thing wears and fatigues, the uh, soft touch rubber plastic just peels off like that and falls apart. That's one piece. This piece and that piece are like 40 bucks. It's not a big deal missing the door on the little cubby here. Obviously that wood lacquer's all but gone. We've got some aftermarket cup holders, a missing max AC button. Let's get a quick look at the mileage. Kind of a faded steering wheel, dusty dashboard as it sits. I think this car's just done a lot of sitting around. We need pixels. We're at 95,929, so just short of 96,000 miles. We're in need of a navigation display, which is funny. It thinks the uh, date is before the production date of the car. And that is a Mark IV, just on very old software. Get a look in the back seat. Unfortunately, see that one of these mat pockets is torn and broken there. People try to put things in there that are, quite frankly, just too big for these little pockets. And then the plastic breaks and they pull out. You can't buy these new, though I do think that I have a used one around here somewhere. Um, back to the theory that it's been in the sun, we see that the Alcantara rear parcel shelf has significantly faded to gray. It should be very dark gray or a black color. The glove box is stuck shut, so we've got to figure that out. The owner's manuals are here. We need a rear window gasket. The uh, headrest back here, just total sun exposure. The thread dries out, leather shrinks, peels open right at the seam. That door handle's a little sticky, probably hasn't been opened since our inspection. We've got three different types of mats on the car. We've got rubber one back here, some factory ones up front, and then the infamous no mat as well. It's a fairly base 2003 car in that it does not have park distance control. I do not believe it has M audio. It does have folding seats, which is a great option. One of my favorites on the E39. And while we're here, let's take a quick peek under the hood. As expected, the glorious S62 B50. Looks like someone has replaced the expansion tank and the cap, though we are overdue for hood struts. That will not hold itself up. Stickers appear to be in the right place. I don't see any obvious indication of a front end accident or anything like that. We are missing some stickers on the hood, so maybe the hood's been replaced or more likely repainted in the past and they peel the stickers for that. The majority of the mechanicals on this car, as you'd guess with only 95,000 miles, are original. But the control arms and at least the rear struts all appear to be original and they've got real tired, dry, or not ball joints and inner bushings and the car drives a lot better than it looks underneath i figured this would be one that shakes at 50 and you hit the brakes and it pulls a certain direction and and that wasn't the case it actually drove pretty well there's definitely room for improvement we've got a sloppy shifter but we're excited to dig into this and, and kind of restore this car and make it ready for another hundred thousand miles so not everything on this table is for that car we've got a lot of projects upcoming but we've got new Hella headlights here. Super excited to get those in. Those always make a tremendous difference to the way the car presents. We've got a new used navigation display, 16 by nine here from Europe. We've got new rear struts. We're gonna be doing everything but the springs there. There's a new windshield cowl, little side spats, driveline service in here, seat side trim, tie rods, control arms, oil, kidney grills, badges, roundels, strut tops, bump stops, and a whole bunch of stuff that I can't even see because they are buried. We're doing the stainless steel brake line upgrade kit. Uh, that's a must 
in my opinion, on these cars. And I love that my local BMW parts supplier is just like, ah, he knows what they are. Just put everything in a bag. And the fun thing is I can tell you the last three digits of the part number and the approximate price of everything in that bag. Because that's what I do. So I see a belt. I see more control arms, filters, ball joints, a unicorn egg, a door lock actuator, a 545 short shifter, a bunch of fluids, and a lot more hardware and trans mounts. It's fun. It's exciting. This whole box of parts is going to be going on that car in the upcoming weeks. Uh, we've got a couple more items on the way from Europe, things that'll take longer, but certainly enough here to get started. So it's the end of the day. I'm not going to stay too late, but we'll get a few clips in here of the initial improvements. And I'm seeing one that is kind of bugging me right now. That gas door is not at all aligned. We pointed this out in the uh, pre-purchase inspection. and I'll be very careful since that'll be the last time it does that. But it is rubbing right there as it opens and closes and starting to take the paint off that bodywork. So somebody must have pulled this before. Um, usually when that happens, it's because they want to take a piece of the car off for a paint match, perhaps that hood. And whoever put it back on just didn't do a very good job. Bang. Two tools needed for that. Eight millimeter socket on an extension, plastic or non-marring pry tool. Loosen up the two eight millimeter nuts that hold the door to the chassis about an eighth or a quarter turn. Get the door adjusted, carefully open it, tighten them down. Well, we're talking about body work here. Um, let's kind of do a little walk around on that. And uh, I actually sent the customer a walk around video of the car just so we could get a better idea. I don't know what happened over here. Some sort of a light side swipe got too close to the garage. Shopping cart at a store, I don't know. Um, a lot of this would buff out. It's simple paint transfer, but I can feel just running my finger over the door. The door is, is rippled here. We've got a bit of a dent here, and these close to the edge of the panel are real difficult to get out uh, just due to the, what the, the inside of the, the bodywork looks like here. Something hit the door handle here, took off some paint, and then most unfortunately, there's a decent ding right in that body line on this front right door. So we may be replacing this door. I'll talk to a PDR guy. Um, just kind of gauge his interest and confidence in a job like this. But I do have some spare titanium silver doors that I would love to get rid of. So uh, maybe this is the car for him. And I suspect it'll be this rear too. If we open up this door and take a peek in there, you'll see just how that pinches and the hinges are here. So it, it's not an area you can really access and try to push from the other side. And definitely lets down a sub 100k mile 2003 car. Front right fender looks good. It's hard to tell in, in this um, just, you know, interior artificial lighting and uh, with all the water on the car. We've got some blue paint transfer here. Certainly some scrapes and chips on the bottom of the bumper. Life happens. It's normal. You got to refinish these every couple of years. Bumper fitment's decent. It's a little bit forwards. And then the pork chops are installed incorrectly. Bit of a scrape on the mirror. I bet something like that would polish out pretty well. And I don't see any notable damage on this side. I think there's wax residue actually here, or maybe something damaged the clear coat right around that handle. And then the exterior handles are fading with a bit of clear coat peel, part for the course for a California car. So the next job I can do without a lift brings us under the hood. And I'm gonna need my tool to hold the hood up because that's not safe. But uh, we're gonna pull out these cabin boxes, really clean them out really well. These get just gunked up with leaves and, and debris from being outside or parked underneath trees or whatever it is. And then we talk about the sandwich. The cowl has to sit on top of the lower cabin box. And we've already made corrections here just so we don't run any risk of damage and having the car outside in the rain or having it washed or something. I thought the previous owner may pick the car up again, uh, but it looks like it's changed hands and it's, it's here to stay for a bit. So we'll take those off, put them in the parts washer, make those boxes look like new. And then there's two important ducts that need to be cleaned out as we get the lower box off. As a shop, a little tool like this is an absolute must. Super simple. Green tag uh, keeps you from forgetting it. Tighten that down over the strut to hold it up until we get some new struts in there. In the meantime, there's our before. Looks like we've got some sort of hair or otherwise fuzz, some pine needles, a busted zip tie, a lot of leaves and goop in there. The original windshield cowl here, you know, the original windshield cowl here has cracks all over it and uh, isn't terribly faded. That may be because it's wet. Where it's drying out does look pretty gray. So looks like I'm going to be pulling the wiper arms off and doing the cowl now too. It's the same story over here on the driver's box. Lots of stuff under the wiper there. Just gunk. Gunk from being outside. That's right. We got a new tool here at the shop. Big ass parts cleaner, 40 gallon or so if I recall. And this thing makes jobs like this 
really easy, really fun. We got the little brush like this, it pumps our solution through here, and we can really get in there with the brush, agitate all the dirt, wash it away with the oil eating solution, and have these things pretty much look like new at the end. And as I suspected, both of the uh, drainage ports on these were completely clogged. This is the one you really gotta watch for here. It's down at the bottom, it's a little rubber, 90 degree elbow, and it just pops right out if you squeeze it and pull. You could put it in the sink or stick some uh, wire pipe cleaners in there, whatever, clean it out. You'll just find caked leaves and debris. Uh, you want that to be clear. And then the larger one uh, here on the side, let me get that one nice and clean too. After the parts cleaner, they just come over here to the sink and get washed down with some warm water. Wipers and cowl are off, and boy did that leave a mess behind. Check that out. There's pieces of it stuck everywhere. It's a hell of a lot better, but whoever put this glass in here used way too much butyl tape down at the bottom. It's an aftermarket Sigla brand windshield that's in pretty good shape and seems to be installed well otherwise. It does sit a little bit low in relation to the body. I know there's a spec for that, there's a tool for that even, and mine was done with spec and it appears to be pretty much even. Haven't noticed wind noise as a problem, though I haven't driven this on the highway very much. In fact, I've only done our test circuit. I'm gonna go ahead and test fit the cowl right now. I didn't notice that it was fitting poorly before. So we'll get that on there. And if it looks like it's gonna fit okay, then I think we'll just proceed with the installation. If not, we will need to remove some of that excess butyl tape. Anytime you have this driver's cabin box out, you wanna get in there with a vacuum cleaner and remove any debris, any leaves, any junk. Um, kind of under the, the booster here is a drainage hole. You always want to make sure that that is clear and free in case any water does get in there. You don't want the booster to ingest that. That can pump it into the engine and hydrolock the engine, which is bad news bears. Also get a look at the brake fluid. Uh, we already did that during the inspection. We're going to be doing the lines and fluid on this car anyhow. It's a little bit low and it's pretty dark. Okay, cowl fits great. New hardware's in. Side spats, side grill extensions as they call them, are installed and looking magnificent. I also took a moment and changed out the hood struts. So, the hood works, and it should push itself up from about half. No hands. As you may guess, it's the same story with the trunk. It feels really heavy, and even from there, it doesn't stay. So let's do those. That's what that's supposed to look like. A lot lighter, springs itself open, and will even hold itself open about two inches from closing. Up next is the fan and fan clutch. We take these out during our multi-point or pre-purchase inspections and just take a look at the dates on here in addition to feeling them and listening to them. My recommendation is to replace these every 10 years or about 100,000 miles. Uh, the problem is the fan clutches just wear out and then they can, usually they, they wear out in a way that means the fan doesn't spin at the right RPM. You can have overheating issues, things like that. But occasionally they'll seize and mate the fan RPM to that of the engine. These are not designed to spin at 7,000 RPM, and if and when they do, the old brittle plastic fan blades are known to come off, shear off, explode, and then you got pieces of that going through your hood, radiator, cooling system, belt drive. Not good for anybody. So what we see here is an original genuine BMW or Bear brand fan clutch, and there's no date code on the front. But what I'm seeing on the back here is very strangely 2000, and this is a 2003 car. So that's a little bit suspect. And then we take a look at the fan blades here, and we'll see that they were produced in February of 2004, which means that they've been replaced, but they're nearly 20 years old again. So this whole thing goes in the round file. Here's the new kit. We've got fan blades with a 2022 date, so those are quite fresh. And our fan clutch is a Male brand dated September 2021. So it's just been on the shelf for a little bit. The new screws that are used are Torx 30. They go down to 89 inch pounds. I use a quarter drive torque wrench and an adapter to a Torx 30. A quick note on installing and deinstalling the fan clutch. So I use this as part of an old kit, super thin. Um, this is the counter hold for the water pump pulley. And we use the ones that are closer together. I've modified this to be compatible with the BMW S52 motor out of the E36 M3. But for the M5, we use that side. If the pulleys aren't lined up, put your wrench on there and just rotate it until they are lined up. 
And instead of using the wrench that came with this, which was too thin and flimsy and it was hard to stay on there, and we actually bent it on a real sticky one one time, we use this, what do we got, performance tool, I don't know, probably Home Depot or Harbor Freight, inch and a quarter. And the benefit is that it's significantly thicker. And in conjunction with that, it's the perfect thickness to hold the wrench on there and the counter hold on the water pump so you don't have to fiddle with it and they don't keep falling off. And of course, keep in mind that that is reverse threaded, so righty loosey, lefty tighty. And I used to just put them back on and spin them until they were tight and just figure that it would tighten itself down as the engine ran until one time on an E65 745 LI, we turned the engine off and heard a bunch of noise and thought, what the hell was that? Well, the fan fell off. As the engine stops, it kind of jerks it the opposite way. So now I put them on there and just snug them up. All right, let's do a high yield repair here. So this headlight on the right appears to be original. It's got a pretty hazy, foggy lens. You know, it looks like a high mileage older car headlight. But... On the left, it appears to have been replaced. This one's a lot cleaner. I can't see any stickers. They've fallen off. I can look at date codes when I pull them off. I don't know if something happened. Maybe the adjusters went in that under warranty or something. But either way, both of them are going to go. They're going to be replaced with Euros. And they're going to look badass. So let's do that. Oh, look at that. It took a little longer than anticipated. We've got some sort of an issue here on the right light. Uh, the ballast didn't seem to like coming out, getting a quick little wipe down and going back in. I'm actually out of used ballasts and ironically ordered a few more today. So try that in a few days when it comes in. I tried different bulbs. It just seems intermittent. It's all the symptoms of a bad ballast. But they're in, cleaned everything up behind there, changed out the brackets. Major, major improvements. And the last thing today, it's approaching 11 p.m. I've got nice, fresh kidney grills that aren't loose and falling out like the old ones were because all the tabs were broken. You'll notice I've also reassembled the cowl and cabin boxes, although that's nice and clean. I cleaned up the plenum, front core support, and the fan shroud. More detailing will resume when my back is feeling a little better. We'll do those strut towers. We are doing these reservoir bushings. As you can see, those are real saggy. Uh, so we'll get to those tomorrow or later this week and clean up the air boxes and intake snorkels as well. We're back at it the next day, and we've got a fresh trunk rundown. The old one had a lot of splintering and just clear coat fade, so that's nice and new, including new grommets. We found out that the grommets were painted titanium silver, so someone's refinished this trunk lid, at least the vertical section, in the past. Up next, we've got a Mark IV computer software update. We're going up to version 32, which is 4-1 slash 00 in the system. Yes, I still use my own instruction sheet that gets sold with the uh, discs that I make available on our website, e39source.com slash shop. It's fairly simple. We put a voltage regulator on the battery, driver's door stays open the entire time. Take out your map disk, put in the software installation disk, and then just be patient. Let the computer do its thing. You get a little bit of Windows NT looking uh, graphics here as the computer updates. I've noticed that the Mark IV computer takes maybe two or three minutes to update. Uh, Mark III computers, the previous generation, take more like 10 minutes to update. After that, it spits out the CD. You remove that from the computer in the trunk, hit OK, and the system reboots. This is the modified version that includes the M logo splash screen and a couple other goodies. It'll auto accept that screen after about five seconds. There we go, 4 1 slash 00. I'll show you guys the little hack here. I haven't done this in a video forever. So, with this software update, the latest on the Mark IV computer, we can actually turn on perspective maps, and that gives us a 3D look to the maps, uh, similar to what you'd see in an E60. So, they built this function into the Mark IV computer, the Mark IV only. You cannot get it on the Mark III, but it was never actually enabled from factory. You have to go into the secret menu to turn it on. So, you enter settings like normal. Then we press and hold the menu button for about 10 seconds, and that's going to take us into the secret menu. Now we're in the secret menu. We can release the menu button, scroll all the way down to the bottom to perspective, select, select again, and you'll see that toggle to on, at which point we can go back into the secret menu and see that there's not really a whole lot of other useful things here. Sensor check just shows us uh, satellite connections, wheel speed sensor, live data, GPS, you get software date and version, video module, this car's not equipped, navigation, just a bunch of crap, navigation graphic elements, hardware software levels, encoding index, supplier information, onboard computer is all just the same thing. Telematics, maybe we can see what uh, car the computer was originally from. CF92574 is the VIN of this car, so that's the original 
uh, original navigation computer, and we can actually program a color into that if we wanted to. So let's go ahead and set that to silver just for fun. And the license plate will be changing, I imagine, but you could input that as well, and the phone number. To leave the secret menu, you just hit the menu button again. Okay, who else is tired of looking at this screwed up map screen? Let's swap that out. So in the middle of the nav's display change, I decided to pull this thing out. It is pretty grubby. Both ports there, that's, I think, just cosmetic to match the vent on this side. Vent is full of dust. That's full of goop. I don't know if I want to know what that is. And I was able to find a Max AC button. So I'm going to clean this thing up and snap the button on there. Okay, we've replaced the Max AC button, cleaned the hell out of the entire panel, verified functionality. So that looks good. I took the SCM switch out too. That was pretty grubby, cleaned all the buttons in the module, put that back in place. As I removed the aftermarket cup holders, I found that the originals were still back there and of course both broken, missing the little tabs. So we take that out of here, that's junk. We've got new ones to put in, but I may shoot him a text and see if he wants to do this tray. Maybe we'll clean that up first. Okay, that actually cleaned up pretty well, uh, just with some Elite Finish Wash Mist and a microfiber. It's not perfect, but that piece is pretty expensive and we're focusing on uh, mechanicals this time around. So for now, we're gonna leave that. If he decides he wants to replace this just due to some finish wear, uh, we can deal with that later as the center console shift knob and uh, kind of the other aesthetics are dealt with. Okay, that's one whole heck of a lot better. Displays in, reuse the bezel, reuse the buttons. They were in nicer shape than the used one. HVAC panel's working, cup holders are in and working and i got the glove box open for the first time since at least 2019 that's the last registration that was in there and i've got it in the trunk i'll show you what happened first thing i did was remove the trim panel and the ceiling in there the passenger's pedal box ceiling and that just pulls forward and comes out and then there's two 10 millimeter nuts that hold the glove box in i was able to take those off and then you've got an electrical connector for the flashlight so that gets unplugged then a whole lot of squeezing and pushing and tapping and screwing around with it and eventually I got it to open up. So as I pull the handle, take a look at those prongs. Those are supposed to go in more and they're not. They're sticking out enough to keep it latched. So I think we're just going to try to replace that piece, this piece held on with the two Phillips screws, and see what happens there. So I've got to go up and crawl in my attic up there and Dig out a glove box. Okay, one more look at the old one. Not fully retracting. This is from my crawl space. It does fully retract. Let's see what failed. Okay, so here's the glove box latch. Out of the glove box, you just take those Phillips screws out and separate it. And then I put it back together for demonstration purposes here. So I've already made the repair. I'm about to put the glove box back in. My initial diagnosis was incorrect. So the key or lock cylinder here is also the first piece of linkage that moves to open the glove box and actuate the, the handle or the latch. And this is gonna be very difficult to film. Um, but as you see, right there in the middle, as I move the latch, that plastic piece rubs against the metal piece, which has a spring on it. And the metal piece moves up and down like that on that other little metal arm and spreads the prongs open. But as you can see, that is not enough. So initially I looked at the plastic piece in here and found that the corner where it rubs the metal piece is quite worn. And I figured that enough material has worn away that it's not pushing the metal piece all the way open. If I hold the latch all the way open, I can then take the metal piece there in the middle that's now vertical and move it another quarter inch, at which point the prongs fully retract into their little housing. So I installed a key into the lock cylinder and removed the lock cylinder. Then I made a diagram so I could take out all of the, the tumblers or different pieces and springs and whatnot inside the key cylinder that, you know, make it work for your key. And I swapped those over to a new, significantly less worn lock cylinder, put them all back in, verified that the key still worked. I'm a little proud of myself there. The last time I did that, I took it out without having a key in there and they all fell out and I had to go to a locksmith and spend a hundred bucks to make the thing work again. But this time I was able to do it myself inside an hour. And I reassembled it. And much to my surprise, we had the exact same problem as before. So I swapped out the metal component of the latch and it turns out, that was the issue. So he kind of got a, a two for one repair here. 
We replaced the lock cylinder that was eventually going to be a problem as it wore down, and then a new used metal component. So the glove box is going back in the car in a moment, and this one will stick around for parts. Sweet. So we've got a pretty hazy faded out M sticker on there from 20 years of sun exposure here in Southern California. I offer my customers two options. We can replace the badge, the M and or the five badge, or for a lot less money, we can install one of these. Yeah, aftermarket, but kind of a high contrast, nice and bright sticker. Excuse the filthy hands here, but we're gonna go ahead and peel that one off and get some fresh color on there. It would be entirely too easy if that came off in one piece. So you scrape it off, now we need some Goo Gone. Okay, we're gonna let that soak with some Goo Gone. In the meantime, I've started another small project up here in the front and finished the project from a few days ago. We had an intermittent right headlight, did turn out to be a bad ballast, so we've got a new used ballast in there. Then I was able to adjust the lights, uh, clear out LRA codes from the broken old lights, get the lights adjusted properly with my marks on the wall. Now we're doing power steering reservoir bushings. We're about to get all this cleaned up here. That's pretty nasty, but if we lay the old one and the new one out among a diff rebuild here, we see that that's not very straight compared to our new one. New bushings are in, top of the reservoir is cleaned up. We'll do the rest of that as we tend to the power steering lines. We'll take the airbox out, clean up the strut tower and apron here. But before this thing was really hanging and sagging down at an angle, now it's nice and tight. So let's get back to the M badge. Hope that glue is softened up. That's a bizarre look, but a uh, couple minutes soaking with the Goo Gone and then just a touch of brake clean to take the Goo Gone residue off. We've got a spotless surface now to apply our decal. Okay, here's an easy one. So the other three are present, but the rear right side lacks a jack pad. Let's fix that. Much better. Now we move on to the trunk. Our MPI noted that there's an issue with the safety escape handle here. Take the handle off of its perch and it comes off completely. The cable connecting it to the linkage inside the trunk is gone. So four weeks after ordering it, we have one here from Germany and now we've got to figure out how to put that in. Okay, I removed the trim panel from the trunk lid here. There's a little screw cover on this side in the handle. Pop that out, followed by a Phillips head screw, and then four rivets in here that just pry out, and then two here that you can use a pry tool to remove. Got that down, took a look in here. The cable itself was fine. It had just come off of the handle. So I reattached it to the handle and tested it three times. It works perfectly each time. I suspect somebody just pulled it way too hard and ripped the whole thing off. So now we'll reassemble that and we're back in business. So I've also found that we have a dead light here, which unsurprisingly has the infamous broken clip. All of these are breaking. So we've either got a bad bulb in there and or uh, problems in the electrical harness here in this weather tube, which is real common. Fresh light, trims back on, we're back in business. Moving down a little bit, we see that there's a few tools missing. We could fix that. There we go. Wheel hanger, 10 mil spark plug wrench, and main lug wrench. That's pretty much a full kit, minus the triangle and the cloth. Now we move on down in the shadows. MPI uncovered that one of those quarter turn clips here was missing. I just popped that in, so that's back in position. That's supposed to be tied up here. But a little acceptor nut, whatever you want to call it, that goes behind that, that white piece of plastic was missing. So I just robbed one of those from my old parts stash. Now we should be able to push that up into position, give it a twist, and it's nice and tight. Needs a bath though. Better yet. Let's stay in the interior another few moments and take care of this dashboard vent, which has a crack down in this corner. And this is super common for the E39. Why it is, I don't know. I don't know if people get mad and start punching the vents. Uh, mine and my M5 was original until I replaced it for funsies when I had the dash out doing the blower motor and my colors had faded, so that was enough to justify a replacement, but my original one is still intact at 230,000 miles. So someone please time, tell me why all of these crack in the corner. Believe it or not, to start to get that vent out, you work down here in the glove box, I took off the strap and the strut, let it hang open all the way. It's a little black plastic panel here and take that off. And this Bowden cable hooks around this uh, piece on the heater box 
and it's got a clip up top that somehow you release. I might need a tool for that. And then you slide the hook part, the green part there off the heater box, and then we'll work up in the dash and pry it out. The old vent is out. It's a bit of a pain to get those clips uh, to play well with you. So looking at the new one, there's a tab right up there at the top below the one or above the one and another tab on the other side. And then the lower tabs are inside a little bit and towards the rear, right there in the center of the frame. So about an inch or inch and a quarter on the inside of the edges. So now we'll carefully install this, point the end of the Bowden cable, uh, just pretty much straight down there. It's a nice open straight shot and uh, pop it in. Vent is in and I'm remembering a tip I learned on my own car. It was a lot easier to remove if you simply pull out your navigation display first, and then you can actually reach in there and up and push the lower tabs up from the bottom. It's about an inch or two inches behind this finish lip right here. So um, that'll save you from having to potentially mar the leather here by shoving pry tools or uh, other flat objects in there. So when that pops in, we come back down here. This clip is a pain in the rear to get on there, but you kind of just put the cylindrical part in there and rotate it up until it clicks and then loop the eyelet over that valve. And for those of you wondering, I'm going to actuate the valve now uh, by turning the dial in between the two vents and we'll see exactly what that does. And the goal for this system is to be able to have different temperature air at the, the dashboard vents than down at your feet. So you've got cold feet, but you don't want hot air blowing in your face. You can adjust that temperature of the dashboard vents independently. It's actually pretty slick. Up next is the driver's mirror glass. I don't know if you can tell in this lighting, but it is quite yellow. A little bit hazy, but definitely a yellow tint. It's an expensive piece, so we'll very carefully remove that one and fit a new one. So to get the glass out, you pivot the mirror so you'd be looking at the ceiling. Bring it all the way out like this. Then at the bottom, you'll find a little notch that's pointed right at six o'clock. And if you use a carefully use a flathead screwdriver in there, rotate the notch counterclockwise over to the right, then the glass will become loose. Now, it won't fall out yet because there's some adhesive on the back of the glass that holds it onto this mirror motor. And I think the idea there is that'll prevent some rattles and vibrations uh, when driving the car, especially on the highway at highway speeds that would just make the mirror appear to be blurry. Uh, so you kind of have to carefully start to pry it out. You'll see some of the adhesive sticks, so I'll just remove that with um, some Goo Gone and a towel. But I cleaned up the inside of the mirror as best as I could. There's three connections got these spades over here. The brown one goes on the bottom. The black one goes on the top. That's either heating or dimming. I don't recall which function, probably heating. And then the dimmer, the wire should be, it'll plug into this with a little tab, but then when you put it back in, you want to make sure that it pushes back there and you'll see these three ribs on the inside of the mirror. You want to be able to kind of lock the connector back in there so it doesn't rattle when you open and close the door. Here's our new piece of glass, and we can see that we need to remove that orange backing there on the adhesive right before we install it. And for fun, we can take a look at the production date here, if we can get that to focus, and see that we're February or March of 2002. So that's an original batch side mirror. So here's what you'll get. See the connector just sits right back in there like that. Plenty of wire. I've got the backing rotated. I'll show you on the old mirror. And then it's just a matter of lining it up and rotating now clockwise to lock it in place. So here's the original glass, and you'll see kind of a bit of an angle on this locking piece. So it just rotates like that, the aid from a screwdriver right there. For anybody curious, this has the exact same production date as the new one I just put on. It's time to do something about this center console. Not only is the inner tray and the handle pretty worn out, but leather's cooked. So we're going to put that one in. Talk about an upgrade. And in perfect timing, we just received the instrument cluster back from Sublet and Pixel Repair. So we've got perfect pixels. And the guys that I use for this, notice how you don't see the uh, kind of a light orange rectangle around the digits around. You can a little bit on camera, but in person I can't at all. It's really just like the numbers and letters are floating on a black display. It looks much more modern. He elected to go with a fresh instrument cluster bezel as well. So we've got that in there. Of course, we had to repair the glue on those switches. But we've got a nice fitment. And that's what that's supposed to look like now. Interior's coming along. 
So the video is going to be a bit out of order. Uh, we still have more interior work to go and some of that's underway, but uh, we're digging into the underbody and some of the driveline and mechanical work here. And we finally got these aftermarket wheels off and they all had castle lug keys that we were unable to acquire the key from, from the previous owner. So we ended up using, I think a 17 or 16 millimeter socket. And finally after 30 minutes got them all out and the good news is they won't be going back on but exhaust system is off no funny business here everything's factory uncut which is nice a little bit dirty we've got original mounts there uh, but they passed my mpi so i think we're going to leave those o2s look fine original cats just an uncut 96,000 mile system and as mike works on motor mounts mm -hmm. over here I'm going to be replacing these chassis covers. The left one I call a fuel filter cover because that's what it covers. The right one I think they just call a chassis cover. And both of these are kind of mangled. We see this all the time where these outer tabs, they're either missing or cracked and broken like this. Obviously, this has hit something in the road before that chewed it all up. This is supposed to be a nice smooth piece. And then par for the course on an outdoor California car, we see the outer perimeter here. Actually, the other side's worse, but this lip starts to crumble apart, and it's not something you certainly see very often, but it is an eyesore. Driver's seat is out, getting seat twist repaired. We've already completed the vacuuming in here. There were a ton of fries, loose coins, garbage, and some staining in the carpet that we'll take some uh, Folex to, see if we can improve that, give the console a wipe down, thorough cleaning in here. In the meantime, I've got fresh trim. For this car the owner doesn't love the wood nor do i so the wood is going to be coming out in exchange for actually other wood but a much cooler more rare less brown wood clean carpeting it is now late march i've been out in florida for the amelia island concours i've been running like crazy trying to catch up on things here we've got a lot of projects going on but it is time for a bit of an update here on the 03 M5, we've got a lot of parts out of the car right now, doing seat twist repair, rear vapor barriers, and door lock actuators, center console, wireless charging, all this trim. Uh, these clips are probably going to be out of order, but we've been saving the old parts, and I kind of wanted to walk you through that, and a lot of this was done when I was not even in the state. And uh, my head technician, Michael, took a bunch of pictures and video that I'll probably splice in here as appropriate, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we'll go through it. So there's the old rear struts, original at 96,000 miles or so. Neither one of them have any gas pressure left. Condition of the bump stops is pretty poor. A lot of cracking, super dry. Top mounts weren't terrible, but I always recommend those when doing the struts. It's kind of a package deal. Moving to the left, we've got the old motor mounts, par for the course. The driver's side one is collapsed and rotting from power steering leaks, which have since been repaired. <laughs> The old transmission mounts, pretty saggy and pulling sideways. Those are real cheap parts, easy to replace. We did a fuel filter. This one was original. It's supposed to be changed about every 30 or 40,000 miles, so no one's done that in 20 years. Got some miscellaneous hardware, tie rods, outer and center. The outer ones had real dry and cracking boots. Center tie rod, we noted some play when doing the outer one, and he instructed us to go ahead and replace that. All four rear upper control arms, the wishbones, and the toe links. They all look like this completely regardless of mileage. Boots just dry out and are gone, leaving the ball joint sockets completely exposed to the elements on all of those. So we've got fresh arms. As you can see, we did the front wishbones and the stabilizer links as well. Keep panning left front wheel bearings. One of them was clicking pretty loudly. They both look really nasty and they were a bear to get out. So we've got fresh bearings in there. And we get into some driveline service. We did a flex disc preventatively, but the CV joint, you can see that boots all chewed up. The center support bearing was making a bunch of noise. So we've got a full drive shaft rebuild. There's the exhaust hardware. We see these break off all the time and we lost two of them here. So we just replace all the hardware and put nuts on them instead of those stupid welded on square things at the end. Of course, we've got a shifter carrier rebuild. There are a couple of parts missing here, including the uh, front carrier bushings. Of course, we replace those, but our process to remove those chews them up beyond recognition. So they went straight to the trash. Shifter rod joint, the clip that holds the carrier onto the front, the rear carrier joint, miscellaneous underbody hardware. Differential reseal, input flange seal, as well as the output seals. Here's the differential bushings. If your M5 has over about 50,000 miles on it and has original differential bushings, you are due. The rear ones take a long time to become a problem, but you can see the cracking up there at the top about one o'clock. And it's always the top corners that start to crack out. So you wanna replace those. But the, the bigger reason for replacing the differential bushings comes in play with the front bushing. 
and this one isn't terrible, though it is quite dry. We've taken a lot of these apart where they come out in two pieces, and not because we've forced it out, because it was already broken. The center sleeve in there works its way out of the rest of the bushing. As the rubber ages and deteriorates, that bushing is no longer tight. Now you have a 369 pound foot of torque jackhammer jackhammering on your front aluminum differential mount and that's known to shear off to expand the bore in that mount and it just causes all sorts of problems. Initially you get clunks, sloppy driveline feel, people keep driving until the mount shears off and then it's really expensive and a whole heck of a lot of work. This is the old rear window gasket. Uh, pieces of it were missing, dry, flaking apart, typical. Done some interior work with the rear parcel shelf. So it had to come out to replace the speaker grills. Yeah, they look like that before. That's not from us breaking them. And while it was out, it was so badly faded, I asked the customer, would you like to have this rewrapped in genuine Alcantara? And I showed him what those look like. He approved the additional work, and we had that done. So I put some pictures up now or a few seconds ago, and that makes a tremendous difference. We also did the C-pillars. There's both of the rear door lock actuators, the child safety restraints. You touch those, they just crumble apart. All the tabs are missing on the backside, so they wouldn't go in. The AUC, or air quality control sensor, was throwing a code, so that's been replaced. Then we get on to the front left pork chop. It doesn't look terrible at first glance, but we are missing um, one of the screw bores, and it was hanging so loose because all of that plastic in there is just cracked apart. And then we're currently in the midst of replacing the side seat trims. Why? Because this tab is broken, which causes them to hang off the side of the seat, creating a gap and a lot of rattling over bumps. Those are actually sold in a set. So here we've got the seat. This one's being repaired. Currently, and will be finished up tomorrow. Um, we take off the flange at the end, trim the material down to, uh, I believe it's 16 and a half millimeters or so. What happens is the rubber hose just expands, and then the tube that drives the gearbox to adjust the seat is no longer making contact with the motor. So you hear the motor running, but nothing's happening with the seat. And the twist happens when that happens on one side, so only one side is driving. It's a problem BMW fixed years ago, even with the E60 and E46, but E39s and E38s all suffer from that. And lastly, belts and pulleys here. We noted during the MPI that the AC belt was in really bad shape. We've got a lot of missing pieces. It's dry, cracking, um, long due for replacement. But doing that, we noted that the serpentine belt somewhere along here has chunks out of it as well. So we just went ahead and did both belts. And then of course, all the pulleys spin way too freely and click and make noise. So we've got fresh belt pulleys in there as well. The following few clips were recorded by my technician Michael while I was in Florida for the Amelia Island Concours.
Today I removed the old M5 badge, which was installed improperly. It was too low, so following the factory specifications, we've got a nice fresh badge, nice bright sticker back there now, which looks considerably better. And we've installed some fresh trim. We're in the process of installing fresh trim in this car. Birch Anthracite, crazy rare, crazy beautiful trim that has not been available, I imagine, now for a very long time. But uh, thanks, Daniel, from the Facebook group and multiple other forums for um, making this available. And I really think he's going to love that. It's a beautiful trim, and this is in magnificent condition. We had to replace a couple of clips behind it. Got the door panel cleaned up fairly well here. There's a couple of marks on it that uh, we'll see if he wants our leather specialist to look at. But we'll be getting the rest of that in later during the week. I've got a set of headrests on the way for obvious reasons. California cars with no tint outside for decades just means you're going to have to do a lot of work like that. There's a partial shelf. Absolutely beautiful. Fresh speaker grills. And the child restraints, you can no longer buy, well, you can, but they're in Germany, these vents. And thankfully, they're thick enough plastic, they come in and out. Even if you manhandle them a little bit, I've actually never broken one of those vents. So those are reusable pieces, in addition to the trims that are under the headrest because they are protected by the headrest. We've got a couple trims installed up front. We've got the driver's door, and we've got this little piece, which I will need to carefully remove again, seeing that... The trim piece over here in Birch Anthracite does not allow a cutout for our RDC or TPMS switch. And the solution there is going to be buying a plate that replaces this dead pedal with an adapter plate that will then allow us to pop the switch in. So we'll just relocate the switch up here to the cluster bezel, which of course means taking that out again. When that part comes in next week, we'll make the swap and finish installing the trim. This piece over here, mint. Not a single imperfection that I've been able to find in it. All we see now are reflections. Passenger door is on. We've got some protection down there just for moving the seat in and out. And the carpeting under here was, you saw the driver's side. The passenger side was about as bad. Just a lot of debris, trash, stains from coffee and Coke and whatever's spilled in here over the last two decades. But thankfully, it all cleans up really well. Back under the hood, I did a bit of work here uh, late at night. We ended up needing to replace this pump. Well, I'll show you the old one. Got some old parts here. This is the old intensive washer pump and it has completely split open down the casing of the pump due to internal corrosion. I did not test it to see if it worked, but if it does today, it probably won't tomorrow. So we've got a new pump in addition to the filter and grommet that goes into the reservoir below that. And then here's another thing. If these are original, the power and fluid supply lines for your washer reservoir, they are so brittle. You put any flex in here, everything just cracks and crumbles apart. And once it's cracked open, of course, that means you've got no pressure in the system and it's all going to come out of there, making a huge mess. So those were no longer available for probably about a year. Thankfully, they are available now, genuine BMW. And uh, I went ahead and replaced that in addition to the washer nozzles, heated washer nozzles. So we've got two new nozzles, the entire harness run perfectly installed per factory specification all the way down here and to our new pump and filter. I also took the old under trays today, which are in remarkably good condition. A handful of scuffs on the bottom side of the belly pan, but no cracks or damage to speak of. Put them in the big parts washer, spent some time with a brush, quite a bit of time actually, and that's all cosmoline or just something that doesn't come off. But they cleaned up really well. They're nice and black and not coating my floor with oil anymore. Somehow it looks like even the key was left out in the sun. Time for a new badge. That looks better. Center console tray is out. He did decide to replace that. There's the original one after I cleaned it up. And there's our nice fresh new one that we're about to modify with wireless charging. Hey, we're back. It's summer now, and this car is about to be delivered to its owner on Saturday. Today's Thursday, so let's wrap this thing up. We have been busy, busy, busy around the shop. We have a lot of projects going on. We had a Z8 in here for a while. I've got an E92 M3 that's about to move in. There's just lots and lots going on. Kenan's car is... Uh, three quarters done with timing chains and guides at 225,000 miles. Uh, so we've been extremely busy and so has the owner. There's been a couple of meetup attempts, pickup attempts that have fallen through. And, uh, you know, as these jobs go, we kind of keep increasing the work scope. And this car has undergone an even more dramatic makeover than 
I dreamed in the beginning. When this car came in here, I looked at uh, my coworkers here and, and said, you know, with the right owner, we could really turn this car around, do something really special with it. And that's exactly what we've done. And it's been an absolute pleasure. So we'll take a few minutes here in these final clips, uh, walk around the car, in the car, under the hood, etc., and talk about what's been done over the past few months that it's been here. So we're already outside the car. Let's talk about paint and body a little bit. And we invested a lot of time and resources here to make this car look like it does today. If you remember those clips way back 40 minutes ago, now right in this video where it came in, it was wet. We had a bear claw down this side of the car. We had dents. This front right door was replaced. The rear right door was able to be repaired. And they did a marvelous job on this. We've got nice straight panels, a beautiful paint match. And uh, it would take a really keen eye to tell that anything's been done here. We can talk about this trim as well. This side of the trim was all polished and looks really, really, really nice now. It had started to fade and kind of haze over and was just dirty and scratched before. And it has made a total transformation and looks absolutely beautiful. When we had all these trims apart, we went ahead and replaced these gaskets in here, these seals, particularly back here at the Hoffmeister Kink. Those are known to start to dry out, wear, flake apart, look really bad. So with all the trims off, it wasn't too much more to go in there. And the seals themselves are actually pretty affordable. So we've got brand new seals in there. They are a bit of a pain. It's kind of a body shop type thing. Um, these are glued into the door. So somehow they're able to push them out or cut through the old glue or melt it or whatever, fit a new seal in there, get the fitment right, and then reassemble all those trims. On the driver's side of the car, we had seriously faded shadow line trims. Uh, these were uh, kind of a sight for sore eyes and they have been replaced with new factory parts, uh, which yet again has made a tremendous impact to the appearance of this vehicle. You may also remember we had faded door handles, clear coat failure on all four of those. They have since all been repainted. Both bumpers had more than their fair share of imperfections, so they've both been removed and uh, completely refinished, repainted, and clear-coated. The paint match is beautiful. We did have fitment issues on this bumper here. As it turns out, the two impact struts that come out of the front of the core support or chassis or frame rail, rather, in front of the car, those are supposed to be adjustable with a 16 or 18 millimeter male hex socket, and both of those were completely seized up on us. I searched the used market, I talked to my guys I usually buy used parts from, and they're all seizing up. So we ended up replacing both of those with factory new parts. They had to come from Germany. Uh, so we were patient there, but we've got a much improved bumper fitment now as a result. The rear bumper cover has been refinished as well. We just had your typical assortment of light scrapes, scuffs, and damage in the rear. So we're looking super fresh back here now too. The paint on this M5 was originally a weak point and is now definitely a strong point. It almost looks alpine white in here under these lights. As usual, this is thanks to my friends at Elite Finish in San Diego. They do an unbelievable job with paint correction, paint restoration, ceramic coatings, just the gloss and depth in this paint is now something to marvel. They're the only ones I trust to work on my M5 as well. It's been through their process and goes back annually for touch-ups and CarPro reload applications. I don't recall if these wheels were on in the last clips, but the customer did supply me with these genuine BMW style 65 staggered set of E39 M5 wheels from Europe somewhere. They came in with a just a bit of a darker finish than what we generally recreate here in the US but I think they look incredible. They're in marvelous condition, straight, true, and finally, good to see the proper wheel on this M5. With the wheels, the customer elected to replace the M stickers as well as update the wheel center caps to the proper 2002 plus version. Let's take a look inside. There's been a lot of changes and upgrades in here as well. So firstly, we'll see a brand new steering wheel with new trims. We already had a replaced airbag under the factory recall. This makes a huge difference. You can't drive the car without touching the steering wheel. It's constantly something that you interact with. And having a nice, matte, clean steering wheel in here just goes the extra mile. We did the shift knob as well. The rest of that birch anthracite interior trim set is on. A few clips ago, I was showing how the TPMS button is relocated up here next to the fog light switch. It's pretty slick. This panel uh, could fit a little bit better. It's not a perfect match to this, but it's very cool that someone is making this. And uh, the button is actually flush in there, so when you reset it, it just presses in a little bit. We've got wireless charging in here in a brand new, nice matte black, clean, not scratched, not worn out center console tray. Little things like that really add up to completely take the time and miles off the appearance of this car. I should have done a more thorough job filming the seats and the interior leather condition when this car came in. It wasn't terrible, but it was pretty dull and just worn, scratched, not as black. Um, and we kind of turned my leather specialists loose in here for two or three days, actually. They came back several times. Front seats, back seats, door panels, dashboard, 
and uh, what they're able to do with leather blows my mind. I figured these seats were kind of beyond a full restoration and I was wrong. They really cleaned up, now they look great. The rear view mirror had been repaired before, but not very well. Looks like the back side of the glass had gotten really dirty, had smudges and staining in it. So I sent this off to my rear view mirror specialist and they were able to make it look new again. A couple more interior items. These just went in today. I always save these for last, so there's a minimal chance of any damage or wear happening before it gets to the customer. But we've got brand new, fresh M5 logo door sills on both front doors and a complete set of the latest version of these floor mats, which have, in my opinion, an upgraded or better looking M5 logo. I know that this is a bit controversial. Some people don't like the way that looks. I think it looks really sharp, really crisp. Seems like I'm doing this on every BMW we get in here now, but these seat belts were not retracting very well before, and you can see where they've been closed in the door. A little bit of cleaning and lubrication, and they suck themselves right back up in the B-pillar now. When we had the front doors apart, doing body work and the shadow line trims here, uh, we took the opportunity to replace both door brakes or door hinges here. And I had tried to replace the pins before, but I think the eyelet on the uh, body side of the door brake here had just expanded. Anytime you open the door and it would pass through its stop points, you'd hear these clicks coming from that. It was super annoying and just doesn't feel like a premium car. So new door brakes in there, totally silent. Under the hood, we've got a fresh plenum badge here. This goes a long way to dress the engine up. The old one had just started to wear and fade. Got to those strut towers, as I mentioned. They're nice and clean now. We've replaced the radiator preventatively, as this car is going to be driving a couple of days, several hundred miles back to its new home. So we wanted to make sure he's in good shape regarding the cooling system. Then I got a warning during my test driving for the washer fluid. I thought, no big deal. We'll put some fluid in there. And as I did, it all ran out over the floor. The filler neck here turns into a corrugated tube. And as it turns a corner to go back into the reservoir, which is right back here behind the fender, one of those uh, corrugation valleys, as I'll call it, had just split open and it was leaking all of its fluid. So we've got a brand new filler neck in there now. This M5 has been through our pre-delivery inspection, which ensures final quality control right before delivery to the customer. Everything passes with flying colors. We've got no returning codes, and we're very excited to deliver this car this Saturday. Thank you so much for watching this video. It has been a true honor and privilege to work through this car and turn it into what it is today. We can't wait to see the customer's face on Saturday at pickup and uh, get that first text when he's made it home and see how that drive was. If you've got a BMW that could benefit from some TLC, please don't hesitate to reach out via email, ryan at e39source.com. I'd love the opportunity to work with you. That's it for now, guys. Time to get back to work. Talk to you in the next video.